<clears throat> there was a correction notice in a um, local Oregon newspaper, <clears throat> and, it, and it read the title of first Christian church program in last week's bulletin was written as Our God Resigns. <clears throat> the actual title is Our God Reigns. <clears throat> so here, it highlights what a difference one letter makes. And I want us to remember <clears throat> that God, <clears throat> excuse me, that God has not resigned from his church. In fact, he reigns over his church. He is the head of the church. And as we're going to see in this passage, he intends to bless his obedient people in the days ahead. And as we saw in the previous messages here in Haggai, the Jewish people, they returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. And from verse 1, we see that they were more concerned with their own comfort and wealth than with the things of God. And then Haggai comes in and he gives a prophecy and there was a good response and a, quite an immediate response to Haggai's call to build a temple. But many among the remnant were outwardly religious, <coughs> but their heart was not right before the Lord. And so Haggai gives a third prophecy starting in verse 10. Given around December 18, 520 B.C. And at this point, the people had been working on the temple for three and a half months. And as I said, Haggai comes in, gives two more messages. And that's what we're going to look at from verses 20 to 23. And the point of his message is that motives are important to God. So let's look at verses 10. <clears throat> We're going to go from 10 to 14, comment on that, and then work our way to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> on the 24th month, sorry, on the 24th of the ninth month, and I, I just want to remind you again that this is going according to the Jewish calendar, so the ninth month puts us in about December, because the first month, the month of Nisan, is April. <clears throat> so the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, ask now the priest for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold or cooked meat, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? And the priest answered, No. And then Haggai said then, if one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. Then Haggai said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. So what we're seeing here is a clean heart is important to God. And being in a right relationship with the Lord leads to an acceptable service for the Lord. You know, we are rightly concerned about contagious microbes. For example, one of the most contagious viruses known to humanity is not the coronavirus, it is the measles virus. In fact, one person can infect up to 18 healthy people. <clears throat> and although one person with the measles can make 18 healthy people sick, 18 healthy people cannot make one person with measles healthy. 
It goes only in one direction. For example, if I had the flu and I shared a Coke with you at McDonald's, would I catch your health? I wish. <clears throat> or would you catch my flu? Well, obviously, that's how it goes. It would be nice if a sick person just had to stand behind a healthy person and poof, they turn healthy, but that does not happen. And that's kind of what Haggai is saying here. You cannot make something that is clean. <clears throat> if I touch a clean thing, it doesn't make me clean. But if I am unclean, then what I do turns that action unclean as well. So what Haggai is teaching here is that a holy work does not make a person holy. No holy object can communicate holiness to things or to people who touch them. <clears throat> Just like a drop of cyanide, cyanide poisons a well, so whatever an unclean person does becomes unclean. No matter how splendid our gifts, no matter how beautiful our actions, we cannot be made holy by our offerings, by our sacrifices, even by our good works. In fact, it is quite the opposite. <clears throat> our defiled heart, if we are not in a right relationship with the Lord, our defiled heart renders our offerings to God, our good works and our service unacceptable to Him. In fact, I want to go to Genesis chapter 4 <clears throat> to highlight this principle. Right from the beginning, this principle comes to light. Here we have two brothers, Cain and Abel. They're both offering a sacrifice. God accepts one, but rejects the other. Genesis 4, verse 3, it says, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord, the fruit of the ground. It's probably a very nice offering, very aesthetic, very pleasing to the eye. And Abel, on his part, also brought the first slings of his flock and of their fat portions. It was probably, his offering was probably a bloody mess. It, he had sacrificed this thing, pulled out the fat. It was just very ugly to look at, likely. <clears throat> and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. If you read on, it ends up very tragically. But I want you to notice something here in verse 4. And the Lord had regard for Abel. He had regard for the person first. Abel was in a right relationship with the Lord. He had regard for Abel and because of that he had regard for his offering. But then it says, with respect to Cain, he had no regard for Cain. In other words, Cain was not in a right relationship with the Lord, and therefore, it didn't matter what he offered, his offering was not accepted. And so what we do doesn't make us holy. Praying three times a day doesn't make us holy. Preaching a message doesn't make the preacher holy. Putting $500 in the offering box does not make a church goer holy. Sitting in the sanctuary doesn't make us right with God. <clears throat> For example, if a gangster comes into the sanctuary, sings the hymns and says amen to the sermon and leaves only to commit more crimes, is God pleased with his worship? Well, no. And so what was going on likely is the people of Judah here may have been thinking because they were doing God's will, because they were building the temple, which was according to the will of God, they were thinking their efforts would make them holy. But holiness is not contagious. We can't become holy by what we do. We can't catch holiness by hanging around those who are right with God. Holiness can only be transmitted as a free gift. 
That's the only way that we can receive the righteousness of God is if he gives it to us as a gift. And he does. When we admit our sin, when we believe in the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and when we call on his name for salvation, God freely gives us his righteousness. I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, or follow along on the screen. <clears throat> this is Paul. And he says that I may be found in him, be found in Christ Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. We can't be found in relationship with the Lord on our own self-righteousness. But we can be found in him through that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes, notice where the source of the righteousness is, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So God imparts his righteousness to us as a free gift based on faith in Christ Jesus. It is the blood of Christ Jesus acting as a spiritual detergent that wipes away the stain of sin. And so when our heart is right before the Lord, then our service to God is holy. Then our tithes are holy. Then our prayers are heard. And our good works are acceptable and God is glorified. <clears throat> you know, there are many ways to vice, but only one way to virtue. The paths to sin are many, but the path to righteousness is one. Jesus said, wide is the road that leads to hell and narrow is the road that leads to life. And again, it is only the only way to a right relationship with God is through faith in the one person, the person of the Lord Jesus. And the only way to be purified is to know the purifier. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said this <clears throat> to Thomas, he said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So there are many ways to sin, but there is only one way to be saved. And so the temple was the greatest cause on earth in that day. That's where the God's presence rested in Israel. And God would be glorified in his temple. Sacrifices would be offered there, pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus. But it is of no account if hearts are not right with the Lord because the altar cannot sanctify the gift. And so what Haggai is teaching the people, or what the Lord is teaching the people through the, Haggai, through the prophet Haggai, is that a defiled heart produces a defiled work. But a righteous person, one who is in a right relationship with the Lord through faith in Christ Jesus, offers a holy service to God. And then what we see is that disobedience to God leads to God's discipline. Verses 15 to 17, he says, But now do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord, from that time when one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, there would only be 10. And when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there would only be 20. I smote you in every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew, and hail, yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. <clears throat> Remember, the exiles had come back from Babylon, 50,000 of them, most of them stayed in Babylon. And when they came, they started to lay the foundation of the temple, they encountered opposition, and they put a stop to it. But then it lay neglected for all that time. 
the remnant of the people delayed the building of the temple in order to pursue their own interests. You see, they didn't add to the foundation. And the delay in the duty of God called for divine discipline. I want you to turn with me to uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28. This is an interesting chapter. In this chapter, there's two mountains, Mount <coughs> uh, Gerizim and <coughs> Mount Ebal, I think is the other mountain. One is blessing, one is cursing. And so they would pronounce all the blessings on the one mountain and all the curses on the other mountain. And so Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, it says, Then it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God, if you're negligent in following His commandments, to observe, to do all His commandments and His statutes which, with which I charge you today, then all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And I want you to turn to verse 38. And, and the curses here are the very same curses that the Israelites are experiencing in Haggai. Verse 38, it says, You shall bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather in little, for the locusts will consume it. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm will devour them. You shall have olive trees throughout your territory, but you will not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives will drop off. And so God disciplines disobedience. <clears throat> And because the remnant of God's people neglected to add bricks to the foundation, because they neglected to rebuild the temple, they experienced a 50% drop in grain production, and they experienced a 60% drop in wine production. And when more work turns out to be less productive, you work harder and harder, but you get less and less, then we need to consider our ways. What's going on here? Why is this happening? And sometimes God often has to blast away to get our attention. He needs to put obstacles or thwart our efforts so that we will consider our ways. When God calls us to do something and we neglect to do it, He may discipline us for it. And so the disasters that the the people of Judah experienced were put in place to lead them to repentance. Haggai had to show them the link between the hard lessons they were experiencing or the trials they were experiencing and their need to return to the Lord. <clears throat> Sometimes that it is, that's the same with us. God needs to touch us where it hurts so that we may be ready to hear His voice. And so what we're seeing here is that a defiled heart produces a defiled work. But a person who is right with the Lord can offer a holy sacrifice, a holy service. We're seeing that disobedience to God leads to God's discipline. But when we return to the call of duty, when we return to God's will, then He blesses. Robert Murray McShane was a Scottish pastor in the 19th century, and he said that according to your holiness, so shall be your success. A holy person is an awesome weapon in the hands of God. And that leads us to verses 18 and 19. He says, Do you consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider, is the seed still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree? It has not borne fruit, yet from this day on, I will bless you. You see, when the people put themselves first, they suffered the agonies of drought and famine, but when they put the Lord first, then they began to enjoy His blessing. <clears throat> so it appears that for the last 10 or so years, there was crop failure. Every year they were putting a lot of seed into the ground, but reaping little. And that's because God was working against them to consider their ways. 
And so the question is, would the next year's harvest be a good crop or is it going to be another dismal failure? Well, God encouraged them because of their obedience, because they started putting bricks on the foundation and rebuilding that temple. Next year's harvest will be good. The curse will be removed. And while neglecting the call of duty, the remnant of the people experienced the curse. But when they resumed the work, God blessed them. And that's what he means from this day onward. Because you guys have returned to the work that I called you to do. Now the seed that you're putting in the ground will reap an abundant harvest. In the same way, when we return to the call of duty... God blesses. And God's blessing is immediate. From this day onward, from the day they resumed the building of the temple, the blessing of the Lord was upon them. And although their past harvests were dismal, at the next harvest they would reap an abundance of crop. And the blessing is given as a result of obedience. And I believe God blesses more readily than we think. His blessing gives results that are out of proportion to human ability. An example of that is found in the Gospels. When Jesus fed 5,000 people, he had a few fish, a few loaves of bread, in that, God blessed that small portion of food, multiplied it enough to feed 5,000 people. God's blessing gives results that far outweigh the proportion of our ability. <clears throat> we may be rich or poor, we may be healthy or ill. We may be living in a mansion or hiding on a cave. If we know the blessing of God, we have something the world can never take away. <clears throat> God's blessing is the most important thing, I believe, in our labors. Without his blessing, <clears throat> our labors can be deficient. And so what we're seeing here in this passage is that a defiled heart produces an unholy work. But a person who is right with the Lord, their offer, their service is pleasing to God. We don't earn salvation, obviously, by our good works, but when we are saved, our good works become pleasing to God. And we're seeing as well that disobedience to God leads to God's discipline. But when we resume the work, when we get back to what God has called us to do, he blesses our efforts. And now Haggai's prophecy shifts from the remnant of the people to the ruler Zerubbabel. He gives a special prophecy to Zerubbabel in verse 20 to 23. And let's look at that. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of the kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declare the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> so God promises to bless his obedient people, but he also promises to destroy ungodly dominions. <clears throat> a whole lot of shaking is going to take place in this world. I believe that when truth and justice do not control national life, then we should expect self-destruction. Notice the phrase in verse 22, everyone by the sword of another. 
This highlights the principle that when people are opposed to God, then they're often opposed to one another. I believe, and I believe the scripture teaches this, that the best protection for any nation is the body of Christ. We are the salt of the earth. As long as Lot lived in Sodom, Sodom survived. The moment Lot was removed from Sodom, it was destroyed. Salt preserves. But when salt is removed, the food spoils. In the same way, the true church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia of God, is a preservative. Remove the church and the nation rapidly decays. Or, if the church is compromised by sin, it loses its preserving effect. But while the world may be out of control, desperately seeking to minimize the chaos it creates, the Lord is not out of control. He oversees history, He oversees nations, and He moves them to accomplish His purposes. And His ultimate purpose is that he be glorified. And so we have a choice. We can either cooperate with his purposes and be blessed, or we can resist his will and experience his displeasure. And even if we did fight against him, we cannot thwart what he intends to do anyway. And so Zerubbabel here is part of God's plan for the future. Notice he is not only addressed as governor of Judah, but if you go down to verse 23, he is also called my servant. And the term servant in prophetic scripture is loaded with messianic significance. For example, in Isaiah 53, my servant. Jesus is referred to in prophetic scriptures, Isaiah 53, as my servant. So when we study prophetic scripture and see the term servant, it often is loaded with messianic significance. And so Zerubbabel represents the resumption of the full messianic line interrupted by the exile. So what happened is you have a prophecy that from the line of David, all from his descendants, the Messiah will come. But what happened was the Babylonian exile put an end to that dynasty. But as servant of the Lord, Zerubbabel will be in the line of the Messiah. He will be an ancestor of the Lord Jesus. And it's interesting, when we study the genealogies of Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we find they both show Jesus descending from King David, but through different sons of David. <clears throat> so what happens is you have David here in the genealogy, you got Solomon in the Matthew genealogy, you got Nathan, the fourth son of David in Luke's genealogy, and then they separate, and then you get Zerubbabel in Matthew's and Zerubbabel in Luke, and they join and converge and give birth to the Messiah. Matthew chapter 1, verse 7. This is the genealogy with respect to Joseph, the father of Jesus. Matthew 1, verse 6 and 7. Jesse was the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, and then it goes on. And then if you go to verse 12, it says, After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Sheltiel, and Sheltiel the father of Zerubbabel, and then Zerubbabel was the father of Abihud, etc. So you get David, Solomon, Zerubbabel, and then later on Jesus. If you go to Luke chapter 3, verse 31, well, the genealogy in Luke is backwards. Well, 
backwards with respect to Matthew. It starts with Jesus and goes down to Adam, whereas Matthew starts with Abraham and goes to Jesus. So they're kind of opposite directions. Verse 31 says, <clears throat> The son of Melia, the son of Mena, the son of Mathatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David. So it's not Solomon here, the son of David. It's Nathan, the son of David. So there's a divergence now. But then if you go to verse 27, then it says the son of Joanan, the son of Risa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri. So they start at David, they diverge, and they come back to Zerubbabel. <clears throat> so that was the promise. The two lines of David resume after Zerubbabel. Though they diverge, they come back. And this shows the sovereignty of God, that even though the dynasty was interrupted, God was still accomplish his purposes in ensuring that the Messiah comes from the line of David. <clears throat> it shows that the line of David may be assailed, but it will not be destroyed because God is sovereign over history. <clears throat> so in conclusion, just a few thoughts here as we close. <clears throat> as we're seeing in this passage, an unholy people cannot produce a holy work. Only when we are right with God can we offer an acceptable service to God. <clears throat> so if you're seeking to please God by your good works, if you're hoping to find God's favor by going to church, by <clears throat> giving your money or doing whatever religious work, that you seek to do, if you seek to earn God's favor in this way, well, I'm sorry to break the news to you. <clears throat> you are misguided. The only way that God will accept our service, our works, our offerings, is if we admit our sin, believe in the Lord Jesus, and call on his name, then we are made right with God. And then our service to God is pleasing to Him. <clears throat> Second thing is this, disobedience to God leads to God's discipline. <clears throat> but when we resume the work that God has called us to do, I, I remember there was a time in my life where I kind of turned my back on ministry and went back to teaching high school. And I knew that I was not fulfilling what God had called me to do. And eventually, through various circumstances and God's discipline, I was miserable doing it, He brought me back to ministry. <clears throat> so when we resume the work God has called us to do, He will bless us. So here's the question, is there something the Lord has called you to do that you're putting off, that you're delaying? Is the strong hand of God's discipline on you? Well, let me encourage you. Consider your ways. And return to the work the Lord is calling you to do. And then you will find his blessing. <clears throat> and the third thing is this. Many fearful events are unfolding in this world. Seems like chaos is ruling the day. And yet, the Lord is in complete control. And so as believers in Christ Jesus, we are salt and light. God has called us to be salt and light in a dark and decaying world. And so I want to encourage you that in your sphere of influence, let your light shine before others. And your sphere of influence, do not let your salt lose its saltiness by compromising with the world. God uses us to be salt and light in a dark and decaying world. That is an incredible calling. And let us take that calling seriously. Lord, we thank you so much for 
your sovereign control. You are in control of everything. And even though, Lord, we turn on the news or <clears throat> hear about an event, or it's just like, wow, what more can happen? And yet, even in spite of that, even in all the chaos and craziness that goes on, Lord, you are in control. <clears throat> you are working things according to your purposes, according to your timetable. And thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be salt and light. That we are the hope of the world. Because we have the message of salvation that the world so desperately needs. And Lord, I pray that we will be found to be faithful servants. Not willing to compromise, but obedient to your call. Because Lord, we are the hope of the nations. Well, you are the hope of the nations, but you work your hope through your people. Lord, and if there's anyone in this sanctuary or listening online who doesn't know you in personal relationship, Lord, I pray that your spirit would draw them to yourself. You would convict them of their sin and to repentance. You would convince them, Lord, of their need for your salvation. We don't know how much time is left, Lord. And so I pray that there would be an urgency in all of us, an urgency to come to be right with you and an urgency to tell others the good news of the gospel. And so, Lord, we just commit these matters to you in Jesus' name. Amen.